This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a student looking for a host family and a housing advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning. How can I help you? Good morning. Um, I understand you help fix up students with host families. That's right. Are you interested in... Uh... Yes. Well, please sit down and I'll just take a few details. Oh, thank you. Right. Now, what name is it? Jenny Chan. Can you spell that, please? Yes. J-E-N-N-Y-C-H-A-N. -N right. And what is your present address? Seaview Guest House, 14 Hill Road. Okay. And do you know the phone number there? Yes. I, I have it here. Um, uh, 2237 six seven six but i'm only there after about seven p.m so when would be the best time to catch you i suppose between nine and let me see half past before i leave for the college great and can i ask you your age i've just had my nineteenth birthday and how long would you want to stay with the host family i'm planning on staying a year but at the moment, I'm definitely here for four months only. I have to get an extension to my permit. You're working on it? Mm. Fine. And what will be your occupation while you're in the UK? Studying English. And what would you say your level of English is? <laughs> um, good, I think. I'd like to say advanced, but my written work is below the level of my spoken, so... I suppose it's intermediate. Mm, certainly your spoken English is advanced. Anyway, which area do you think you would prefer? Um, well, I'm studying right in the center, but I'd really like to live in the Northwest. That shouldn't be a great problem. We usually have lots of families up there. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And do you have any particular requirements for diet? Well, I'm nearly a vegetarian. Not quite. Shall I say you are? It's probably easier that way. <laughs> that would be best. Anything about your actual room? Uh, I would prefer my own facilities. En suite, is that right? Mm -hmm. And also, if it's possible, a TV. 
And I'd also like the house to have a real garden, rather than just a yard. Somewhere I could sit and be peaceful. Is that all? Well, I'm really serious about improving my English, so I'd prefer to be the only guest, if that's possible. No other guests. Yes, you get more practice that way. Anyway, obviously, all this is partly dependent on how much you're willing to pay. What did you have in mind? I was thinking in terms of about sixty to eighty pounds a week, but I'd go up to a hundred if it was something special. Well, I don't think we'd have any problems finding something for you. Oh, good. And when would you want it for? I'd like to move in approximately two weeks. Let me see. It's the tenth today, so if we go for the Monday, it's the twenty-third of March. Yes. Right. Good. And if I could ask one last question. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a speech by an official at a meeting of a local football club at the start of a new football season. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming to the soccer club meeting. It's good to see so many parents and children here tonight, and I know you're looking forward to a great football season. Now, I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about some changes to the soccer club for the coming season. Now, this season. We'll be playing all our matches for both the junior and senior competitions at Kings Park instead of Royal Park, which was used last season. Now, for meetings, we're going to use the clubhouse in Kings Park, and the next meeting will be held in the clubhouse on the second of July. As usual, we hope to begin the season with a picnic next Saturday at the clubhouse. Please try and come to the picnic, as it's always good fun. At the last week of the season, we usually have a dinner and presentation of prizes to the players, and more information about this will be given to you later in the season. This season, we have more teams than ever. We hope to have ten teams instead of five in the junior competition, and they will play on Saturday mornings beginning at 8:30 a.m. Training sessions will be held in Kings Park on Wednesday afternoons for the juniors. And they will be wearing red shirts again this year. In the senior competition, there will be four teams, same as last year, and their games will be played on Saturday afternoons, starting at two thirty. Oh no,、uh, sorry, it will be a, a two o'clock start, and the training session for seniors is planned for Sunday afternoons. Before you hear the rest of the speech. You have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the new committee for the soccer club for this season. Uh, firstly, let me welcome Robert Young, the new president, who will manage the meetings for the next two years. Robert's son has been playing football with the club for over five years now, and uh, many thanks to Robert for taking on the job of president. Next, we have Gina Costello. She's the treasurer, and she'll collect the fees from you for the season. Uh, please try and give Gina your fees as early as possible in the season, as the club needs the money to buy some new equipment. Then there's David West, who's volunteered to be the club secretary, and one of the many jobs he'll have is to send out newsletters to you regularly. If you have any information that may be useful, please let David know so that it can be included in these newsletters. Also, I'd like to introduce you to Jason Dokic, who is the head coach. For all the new members here tonight, this is the third year that Jason has been with us as head coach, and we're very lucky to have such an experienced coach and former player at our club. He will continue to supervise the teams at training sessions and on match days. Now, before we finish and have some uh, refreshments, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask the new committee? That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 Listen to the conversation between Bill and Anne, two students who are discussing the talks they have to present to their social psychology class. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. You now have some time to read questions 21 to 25. Hi, Anne. How's it going? I'm going mad. I haven't even started preparing my talk for tomorrow's political science class. Me neither. I've been so busy looking after my mum. She's still ill? Yeah. The doctor says I should get someone to do all her cooking and cleaning for another week or so, but we can't afford to employ someone to help her. The neighbours are all too busy. It's not that I'm too busy with my other classes. That's really tough. I've got no excuses for not being prepared. Too much time playing computer games. Now, how many times have I told you? I know, I know, but at least I've got a topic. Which is? Well, it's about an experiment in Los Angeles, I think, that I read about in social studies at high school. It's about how wearing a uniform can change people's personalities. This professor got a lot of his students to agree to take part in an experiment during the summer vacation but he wouldn't tell them anything about it. As the conversation continues, please answer questions 26 to 30. You now have some time to read questions 26 to 30. Can you remember the professor's name? No, but I think he was from the University of California at Los Angeles. Well, at least you've got the most important thing, a topic. I haven't even got that. So, what happened in this experiment? Well, the prof got the local police to cooperate. One night, they went to about 20 students and arrested them. Poor guys didn't have a clue what for. 
and they didn't know it was the experiment they had volunteered for. They had no idea, and it had been weeks since they volunteered for the experiment. Anyway, the cops took them to a school building that had been made to look like the inside of a prison or a police station. Can't remember. It's not important. And what happened then? Did they get charged or something? Don't know. They must have been told something, but that's not the main thing. Which was? Well, what they didn't know was that about eight other students were waiting at the police station, or whatever it was, dressed up as prison guards. Hey, now I think I read about that ages ago. The experiment took place in the early seventies, and the students dressed as prison guards were told to act like prison guards. I've just thought of something. Did the arrested students know the other students? I don't know. I wouldn't have thought so. No, different schools, because otherwise the ones who thought they'd been arrested might have realised it was the experiment they had signed up for. Guess you're right. But then what happened? Remember? Yeah, the guards really got into it and started treating the other guys like they see on the movies, making them do press ups, cutting their hair really short, not letting them sleep. A real power trip. The poor guys were terrified. Yeah, the experiment was supposed to last for a week, but things got out of control. Remember, the guys who thought they were prisoners, not guards, started having nervous breakdowns. Hey, look at the time. I gotta go. At least you've got something to talk about. How role playing can get real, especially when we put uniforms on. Yeah, and the students were normal, nice guys who didn't waste time with computer games. That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about sales and marketing. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Good evening, and welcome to the second class of our sales and marketing course. Tonight and in the next few weeks, I'll be talking about advertising. To be specific, about different types of advertising, different types of message, all of which, of course, are supposed to make your company or your organization, the government perhaps, more successful. Now, please note that I'm not at this stage going to talk about advertising media. There are various choices here: radio, newspapers, television, billboards, magazines, and of course, the internet. It's almost impossible to go into Google or Yahoo or whatever and not find adverts on almost every page. But we'll talk about the various choices of media later. First, I will stress one thing: advertising can be expensive. Whether you are a small business, an NGO, Or a multinational corporation, so it's very important that what you spend on advertising is money well spent, money that achieves your objectives, whatever they might be. The ads must be cost effective. It is therefore essential to use the right type of advertising with the right message that make it effective. There are several types of advertising. 
aiming to promote one, sometimes more, of the following things. Brand name, company image, a product, a service, rather than a product, or a group, like a manufacturer's association or a cooperative. Can you think of anything else? Right. You might want to make people look after their health better and associate your company with things that can help them do this. But the common aim is that the advertiser wants to change or reinforce people's attitudes and perceptions, and in most cases, their behavior, maybe their buying habits. Which type you choose depends on your objectives. All clear so far? Good. Okay, let's look at a very common type, advertising designed to promote a brand name. If you go out to buy many types of product, toothpaste, detergent, cheese, how many of you think of the name of the company that made it? Right, you don't usually think of Procter & Gamble when you buy the company's Tide laundry detergent or Cascade dishwashing powder or the Kraft Company when you buy Philadelphia cream cheese. That's right, Philadelphia cream cheese is a registered brand name. In fact, the name of the company, Kraft, is hardly noticeable on the package. The point is that these companies have successfully promoted the name of various products, and consumers buy these products primarily because they recognize the brand name and may not even know the name of the company that makes it. So, advertising to promote a brand name is designed to create and keep strong image in the customer's mind of the product, not the company. For example, would you buy Shell? You know, the big oil company? Would you buy Shell beer? It's a famous company, but probably not. Imagine. But what if Shell had bought a brewery and marketed a beer they called Granddad's Old Ale? You can bet that the word Shell Oil Company would be in the smallest print possible and would never be mentioned in Granddad's Old Ale advertising. But when you buy a can of Shell Oil or some gasoline, the word Shell is big and everywhere. So there is nothing better than a good brand name. Now, let's look at another type of advertising. Advertising that is designed to promote a company image. Imagine you've started a new company. You might want to start by getting the company name known first, before you worry about advertising your products and services. One company that did this was in San Francisco, the San Fran Video Store. The managers decided to promote the company name rather than promote the videos they rented out. They put small ads in local newspapers that simply said, San Fran Video Store, a great selection of movies. And they also had people handing out little cards with the same message on them, plus a list of the store locations. So they didn't spend a fortune on advertising. They put most of their money into making sure they had a great selection of movies. And it worked. They started with four stores in 1995, and now they have, at last count, 27. Now, can you think of examples of companies advertising both a product and the company name in the same advert? Come on, you must be able to think of one. What? That's right, a good example. Makers of luxury things like perfume and fashion. For example, when Chanel brings out a new perfume, the advertising message is always something like, Night Light by Chanel. This almost immediately gives the new perfume a good reputation because it's by Chanel, and also reinforces perception of the company name. So, the different types of advertising might not be mutually exclusive. The important thing is that the objectives must be clear, mutually supportive, and not contradictory. Another type of advertising is designed to promote a service rather than a physical product. But our time is up, so we'll leave that till next time. Good night, everybody. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, 
You would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.